This problem asks us to do two things, find the electric field on the outside of this uh, spherical shell that we have here that has a charge density of sigma and a radius of r, big R, right? So we're going to do it on the outside and we're also going to find out on the inside. And uh, if we went back to problem 2.7, you know that we've, we've done this before. If we do it on the outside here, it's just like as if this whole thing collapsed down as a point charge. We do it on the inside in here. We know that the electric field on the inside of a uh, of anything with some sort of perfect uh, symmetry in the middle here, and anywhere on the inside is going to be zero for the electric field. But it didn't allow us to use uh, our wit, and it told us to specifically use Gauss's law. And it makes sense because this is our opportunity to use Gauss's law to um, to apply and back up our knowledge of. Uh, the things that we learned before. So we'll go ahead and start with the integral form of Gauss's law, and that is equal to that surface uh, integral. And that surface integral of the electric field is directly proportional to the charge that's enclosed in it with the uh, proportional, uh, proportionality factor of one over epsilon naught. So we'll go ahead and begin with making, go ahead and deciding our, um, our Gaussian surface. So Typically for Gaussian surface, we want a Gaussian surface whose normal vector aligns with the normal vector of the, uh, the, the, the charge, the radius that we got here. And so since we have a sphere, a good Gaussian surface we can use that has also has a, uh, uh, an aligned normal vector is a, uh, it's a sphere as well. So our Gaussian surface is a sphere because when we look at the normal value for this, for the, uh, the surface normal value that is also directly in line everywhere with symmetry with the one from the, the spherical shell that we have here. So what that allows us to do is to turn this integral into a multiplication. And I'll go ahead and do that now so that multiplication ends up look, looking like the, uh, the magnitude of the electric field multiplied by the, the surface area of that, uh, that surface. And we'll just go ahead and say our... Gaussian surface has a radius of little r, variable r. So that surface area of that Gaussian surface is equal to 4 pi r squared, little r squared, right? And again, there's a multiplication since when you do the dot product between those two, they end up being uh, just one. And that is equal to the charge that's enclosed in it. And if we look at the charge that's enclosed in it, our charge in terms of everything that we were given here, which is the radius and the uh, surface charge density, it's going to be equal to sigma times the surface area of that charge, which is 4 pi r squared. And then we'll go ahead and write that out explicitly right here, 4 pi big R squared divided by epsilon naught. And as you can tell, we can go ahead and just cancel out some things. And the whole point was solving for the electric field. So our electric field is equal to and just uh, sigma times the ratio of r squared to uh, little r squared and one over epsilon naught. And if we want to be totally correct, if we, we can go ahead and just tell from our inspection here that we know that the elect, by the nature and everything we know about the electric field, it always points in the r hat direction. So we can go ahead and just drop these magnitude signs and tack on that r hat right here. And that is our, uh, that's our answer for this part, for the outside. But uh, for the inside, we're going to go ahead and explicitly write it out first. So inside... If we go ahead and draw our Gaussian surface, which I'll, we'll just go ahead and copy and paste down our sphere here and just do a separate section here. So for our Gaussian surface, which, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and draw straight orange. So far, that's our Gaussian surface in the middle. And that one still has a radius of r, little r, right? We can go ahead and just use our Gauss's law in integral form again as a, as a leap pad. It's always good to do this and not necessarily memorize pro problems or anything because you miss out on the principles and that's what you know gets you in trouble on uh, on on test day. So if you can go ahead and see that the normal vector, whoops, the normal vector to the Gaussian surface always points in the r hat direction and that's perfectly in line with the uh, normal vector of the surface from our, uh, con our our sphere. We can go ahead and change this into the uh, the multiplication that we have right here, which we'll go ahead and do, 
times 4 pi, well, so that's the surface area again of our uh, Gaussian surface right here. But now look at this, the charge, what's the charge that's enclosed in here? Since our Gaussian surface is on the inside of our sphere, there's no charge that is actually right there. And so the charge that's enclosed is actually equal to zero over epsilon naught, well, just equal to zero. And so then if we go ahead and solve for the electric field, you know, it's just gonna be equal to zero, which is totally in line with what we had originally uh, found from our problem 2.7. We know from everywhere, from just doing the problems at nauseum that the electric field within a symmetric uh, shell that has a, a electric charge density is always gonna be zero on the inside and so that also makes sense in terms of Gauss's law. Now, if this was not a shell, that would, but if this was a, a solid sphere with some sort of volumetric charge density on the inside of it, that would be a little bit different story because then we would still have some sort of charge Q, uh, some sort of charge density that's in the middle. But that, for this problem on the inside, it's always going to be equal to zero for a shell, and then on the outside, it's going to be uh, it's going to be proportional. Uh, to 1 over r squared, where r is the distance that you get further and further away from the center of that sphere.